Go ahead. Tell us how much you hate these holidays. Oh, you got me all wrong. I am a holiday hardo. I love eggnog and Christmas and the Grinch and blow-ups in my front yard and a real-ass Christmas tree that smells good the whole damn thing. Really? Real tree in the house, huh? Oh, yeah. He hit me uh, the jab when I finally got my tree out and put the photo, got it out of the body bag and put it up and all that stuff. But I figured Hart would hate what the essence of Christmas has become which is spending money, everything frivolous. And since we know he's already a a frugal man, he did not sign on for a million-dollar playground that I would assume that going out and buying a bunch of stuff would would be uh, incongruent to the way with which you live. Quite the opposite, and my wife actually gets annoyed. I'm a cheapskate year-round, and then basically no holds barred for Christmas, baby. Christmas is all in and the credit card bills be damned. Who are you? I mean, like, I feel like... I, His I, heart grew. Yeah. What? <laughs> That's what it was. His heart grew, what is it, five inches that day? I don't know what the hell it is. And wait, hold on. Wait, hey, Andy, inches. do you remember... <laughs> what grew? What? The, 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 Andy, the Andy Gresh <laughs> Christmas tree. A lot of people were looking at that picture that you threw up, and it looked like it was like uh, something out of an airplane that the narcos were trying to smuggle into the United States. No, it looked I, like a bag of weed. Yeah. I have a right? green. No, Body I have. Bag. I have a green yeah. bag that says tree bag on it. I know, it's, but it looked like yeah. like a lot of people. And I first I saw, I was like, dude, he's got a lot of pot. Why is he showing all this stuff? Like, <laughs> that's probably something. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he it. meant to send that. No, that's what it looked like. And then when you looked at it a little bit closer, you could see like the, obviously the branches. A lot of, lot of sticks right. and twigs. Oh, yeah. I think I sent you a uh, once it was done photo yeah, it looks as good well. Though. Yeah, yeah. It's all right. I just don't put it up like uh, Fourier got his up on like November 20th. Yeah. Right after Thanksgiving, you go get a real Christmas tree. You oh, cut it down yourself. Lord. You put it up. You oh, water it. And you live the life. You're a freaking lumberjack now. Listen to this. Well, you know, he, he literally probably thinks, oh, honey. He's got his like you know little flannel shirt on. He's got his big red axe, and and he doesn't have you know <laughs> bathe the big blue axe. axe. He's got the biggest chainsaw going for crying out no, loud. He's got to do it like a real man would never use a chainsaw. That's bullcrap because no, sometimes you, a real man wouldn't do it. No, because after bad storms hit down near where Hart is on the coast, sometimes real men have to get yep. trees out of the road by using a chainsaw. Okay, listen, you're hey, Andy. Uh, Damn right. Uh, okay, look, uh, if you are going to cut your tree down. Uh, and you have two options. You have the chainsaw and you have the axe. Which one would you choose? Well, a Christmas tree would be difficult to cut down properly with an axe because yeah. the branches are out, they're close to the ground. So in that situation, I would take the chainsaw. But what I normally do is just being the giving guy that I am this time of year, you got some high school or college kid who cuts it down for you, and then you give him 10 bucks tip, and he's making good money over the holiday season, and everybody's happy, and he drags it back to the Look truck. Look at that. Oh, see, that's good, too, because I worked at a, at a Christmas tree lot Ten when bucks. I was in high school. It was the greatest job I ever had. Art's getting ripped for yeah. a $10 dollar tip. <laughs> <laughs> what, 10 bucks? That's that'd be pretty good. Well, you're also using an implement that could cut off a part of your body. Oh, please! It takes two seconds. That's like a lot of money for the amount yeah. of time yeah, that actually goes into two, it. It takes two seconds to lose a toe if you do it wrong. Well, and I would assume no one's doing it <laughs> I wrong. Mean, I don't know. Do you think Hart, Hart, when the kid is cutting the tree down with the chainsaw, are you standing there coaching him, telling him how to do it the right yeah, way? Yeah, he's definitely your doing it wrong guy. <laughs> no, he is, you I are 100% do doing it wrong guy. You are the dad. No, Give it to me. I'll do it. No. Yeah. I can just see you right now. No, you got usually, some projects around the house. You're like, just, just give me the damn thing. I'll do it myself. No, I usually have to help because they usually, it's a big tree and he can't cut it down and Usually they use a hand saw, some sort of pruning saw, and then the saw gets stuck and bound up on the pine, and the poor kid is struggling, so I lean on it and pull on the tree, and um, I'm very helpful, very, very helpful, and then I help them when they struggle to get it through the baler thing, because I like my trees, big old fat trees that take up the whole room. So <laughs> well, and, the, and the one thing we know that you're not helping with is tying the tree to the top of the car. I don't know if they have step no, no, stools no, there right. to help you do that. <laughs> He's got yeah, one of those vans shot. with a ladder. <laughs> like the ladder you know on it. Hart, Hart didn't see that coming either. That was a fastball right between the eyes. That was great. I- yeah, absolutely. I was looking curve, and you blew it by me there. No question. No oh, question. baby. All right, so if Bill Belichick would love to get a job offer under the Christmas tree this year from amongst the teams, Andy Hart, that we've talked about that might be looking for a coach, if you're Bill Belichick and you unwrap that present, 
Who do you want it to be from? I think it's the Dallas Cowboys. I think if you're looking at the perfect team on so many levels, he could kill so many birds with one big old cowboy star stone. And it's a team that has talent. We know they're good. At times, they look like one of the best teams in football. You have a quarterback. I'm assuming he doesn't hate the quarterback. You have the closest thing to Lawrence Taylor. We had those. Remember the questions they were asking about Micah Parsons before the Patriots played that week? Is this LT? And he kind of poo-pooed it, but he did have a lot of nice things to say about Parsons. But also, Bill Parcells couldn't win there, so I got one up on Bill. Ooh, I know Robert has a little thing, a little frenemy thing with Jerry Jones. So if I win there, I have a, a, a step up on, on Robert Kraft. I win with Jerry Jones. Jerry Jones is as desperate, maybe, as any owner ever, not getting any younger, getting further and further, further from the dynasty days. So Jerry will give me everything I need to do this in a year or two years. And you do it on the biggest stage. You know, you go from a team that you built into America's team in the early 2000s, maybe, to the true America's team, a global fan base upon which you would just become a god if you could secure yes. that, that trophy. And I think it's perfect. That would be the dream if it was me. Stick it to everybody. Well, okay, so with that dream being uh, still in place, dream, I'm assuming dream. the, uh, the that, that Bill is dreaming about just coaching with no personnel uh, capabilities at all. Right, like he's just coaching the team, and because we all know that Jerry Jones is the GM of that team, and he ain't giving that up. Uh, I don't know. I don't know that he's not giving that up to Bill Belichick out of desperation, and that is what I find interesting here. So, if we are going to play this game and try to like drum up candidates for Belichick, I think a couple interesting teams are the Bills and the Cowboys. The problem is they're both going to be playing in the playoffs. And I don't know when they are exiting the playoffs. I don't know how ugly and emotional the exit is. But are you going to wait around and just let Bill dangle in the breeze from January 7th through January 20-whatever when the Cowboys fall on their faces in the NFC title game, forcing Jerry Jones to make a rash and emotional decision to move on from McCarthy and give up his GM duties? It's an interesting dynamic if you want to proceed as the Patriots but keep all your opportunities open to trade Bill Belichick. But I do, I think for Bill Belichick, I think Jerry Jones would step back. Like he stepped back for Parcells. He's that desperate. I think he would step back for Bill. And you know, Hart, in bringing up Dallas, it also adds another sort of a layer to the scenario in that the only owner who is the GM is Jerry Jones. Jerry Jones, in theory, doesn't have to give up that title but he could also say to Bill, hey, I will listen to you, to where right. it doesn't have to be so formal, whereas in any other job in the NFL, I would think Bill Belichick would want that contractual insulation of saying, no, 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 this is what it says on the piece of paper that here's what my job duties are. In a way, the Patriots could just trade him with that contract, and it could say all that stuff. But the owner is the guy that he's dealing with at the top of the masthead when it comes to personnel anyway. So I wonder, Andy Hart, if it's even a moot point that a Jerry Jones just tells Bill what he needs to hear. He doesn't have to have it, quote unquote, in writing, per se. Right. And I mean, it's similar, as you said, it, you could just pass the contract along, trade it here because he's the head coach of the New England Patriots. No one, you know, you look in the media guy, it doesn't say general manager. It doesn't say say president of player personnel they're like it just says head coach i actually found it interesting the one place i've even seen that recently is when they played the giants and the giants pr department put out post-game transcripts at the top of bills it actually said post-game press conference patriots head coach and general manager bill belichick i can't tell you if i've ever seen that before because it's just understood like it's not actually on paper anywhere on the organizational depth chart or masthead as you'd say so I absolutely think, and I think Bill would go there understanding, what are we talking about? I'm going to be here two years. I'm going to have to make how many calls? One, two. Uh, I get the last guy on the roster. I'll tell you who I want in the first round when we draft. Oh, we don't even have a first round pick because you traded it for me. I'll tell you who I want in the second round. I, I, I don't really think that's actually that big a deal. I, I, I really don't. I could see Bill and Jerry Jones coming to some agreement on that very quickly, very easily. So a- Andy Harder here on the Harbor One Hotline, and Andy – I asked this question to uh, the other Andy, the bigger Andy. Um, 
in regards to uh, Kraft and Bill, like with the assumption that Kraft did not want Bill to coach his team anymore and Bill still wanted to coach, do you think as like a, as a sign of gratitude that uh, Kraft would just fire Bill, let him do whatever he wanted with no restrictions whatsoever or no, sort, no, 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 no deal with the other team as far as compensation for picks? I, I don't really, and I don't know why you would. Um, you have an asset. Your your duty, your loyalty lies with the New England Patriots, right? And to make that team as good as possible and competitive as possible for business reasons, but also just for fan base reasons. And, you know, we already know that Robert Kraft let Tom Brady move on for nothing. And you're going to let Bill Belichick move on for nothing when you actually have a contractual tie to him. You know, we know how things played out through the negotiation with Brady And he ended up with that cockamamie extension and the no franchise tag and all that. His freedom. Well, no, no, no. You have a contract with Bill Belichick. You have ties to him. He is your uh, commodity or property or whatever you want to call it, asset. Um, So, no, I I don't think Robert would do that just to be nice. Like, why? Like, this is Bill Belichick. Bill Belichick wouldn't do that just to be nice, right? He traded uh, Drew Bledsoe within the division. Call call it a parting gift. Call it a parting gift. No. And thank well, you. Why, why do we need parting gifts? Well, because, you, you know, know Kraft is an, is an older. I paid he's, for the... he's like he understands. No. He just. So you're off that altogether. Not even close yes, to being the no. same. Oh, well, you're a big me. My, loyal, my, my loyalty lies with the New England Patriots, my team, my fan base, my organization. Not to give Bill Belichick some golden parachute and let him free from his deal that he just signed. Did anybody hold a gun to his head to make him sign it? Couldn't he have signed a one-year deal? Couldn't he have signed a one-year deal that would roll over? Whatever, you're, Like, no. You signed it, you stick to it. I'll stick to it, you stick to it. This is the NFL. We're sticking to this contract, baby. It's not like players where they don't have any leverage. Well, there uh, that is a very fair point by our guy Andy Hart, who's with us on the Harbor One Hotline. Bill Belichick mentioned earlier today that uh, against Kansas City, they dealt with some pretty heavy seven-man fronts, eight men in the box trying to take away the run. Uh, Belichick said they expect the same thing against uh, Denver. Are the Patriots ill-equipped to deal with a team that is just going to load up and try to say, "Nah, no, nah, go ahead, we'll we'll stop the run. We'll let's let's see what you do now. What would the Patriots do if Denver loads up the way Kansas City did? Do they even have an answer, Hart? You have to go play action and make plays through the air, which they've done off and on you know, over the last couple of weeks to start games. I know Billy O'Brien talked about this yesterday because somebody asked him about the blitzes that they're facing. And he's like, I I think they're doing that because of the run game. The best part of this offense has been the run game over the last month plus, whether it was Ramondre and Zeke and then just Zeke. They've actually run the ball pretty well. Now I know they're dealing with some injuries on the line and you lose Cole Strange now, but um, because of that, teams are like, yeah, we'll run blitz. We're just going to blitz. We're going to blitz on early downs. If it's a run, it's a run blitz. If it's a pass, we're going to go put pressure on Bailey Zappi and see how he reacts. So, yeah, I think that opposing defenses are going to continue to do that until you burn them, until you find a way to hit some plays behind it. And, again, I think they've made a couple plays, but it hasn't been consistent enough for teams to say, oh, we we got to to stop doing that. we got to play this a little more traditional. we got to have less heavy boxes. No, not only are we going to have heavy boxes, we're going to be coming for you. Um, and it's on Bailey Zappi and, and Bill O'Brien to to make plays and some of these receivers to maybe have some catch-and-run opportunities of Pop Douglas uh, to get that done. But to me, that's smart defense with the Patriots right now. Their passing game still has significant limitations, and you can run blitz the hell out of them and hopefully keep Zeke in check. So did you um, – I'm sure you kind of are, are at least aware – of uh, some of the rumors or, you know, uh, Albert Breer with, uh, you know, tension possibly going on with the coaching staff. And, you know, I saw Gerard Mayo's name, Andy, kind of thrown around yeah. like he was a part of that in some way, shape, or form. And then yesterday we get the press release talking about how Gerard Mayo would be available at, during that, that, that 11 o'clock hour with all the other coaches. And sure enough, he doesn't show up. Covington, the D-line coach, ends up speaking instead. Do you read into any of that whatsoever? And do you agree with there may be some tension brewing amongst the other coaches? Uh, I do read something into it, and I blame Andy Gresh oh, for this. Really? Okay. 
Yeah. Fresh. What you know did why? he do? I will. I don't know what I did, but I think I will accept without even hearing the explanation. <laughs> So I have heard Mr. Gresh many, many times in discussions about Bill Belichick being fired in the last, I don't know, month, 30 days, whatever it is, um, say, if you're going to get rid of Bill, you got to get rid of everybody with any ties to Bill. Clean house. Why would you want people with ties to Bill? And obviously, Gerard Mayo, being the supposed uh, head coach in waiting, the heir apparent when he signed his deal, I think he's a smart guy. He knows this narrative not only exists, but that it's picking up steam, that people like Andy Gresh are spreading it to the listeners. And I've actually heard more and more people just in my everyday life say this. Clean slate. I want nobody with any ties to anything that Belichick has ever done. I think Gerard Mayo wants the job. I think Gerard Mayo knows at one point he had the inside track on the job, but he may need now to convince the crafts that he is not just a Belichick right-hand man, a Belichick rump swab, a Belichick product. So I think Gerard Mayo is very um, tactically uh, differentiating himself from Bill Belichick behind the scenes, whether that be with players, whether that be with other assistant coaches, whether that maybe be with an observing owner or ownership group that includes Robert and Jonathan Kraft. So I think Gerard Mayo, who I actually do believe – stands on his own two feet and has his own unique views and is not just a Belichick product. I think he's trying to pump up a narrative that he's more than just Belichick's binky and Belichick's uh, created young coaching uh, mold. So we'll- I will take full credit for that, friend, and thank you. And I even had <laughs> I a co sign on that. And I even had an insulting joke for you on the way out the door that I will <laughs> hold until Friday now. Oh. The holiday spirit. That's An angel right. Got its wings. <laughs> you even made me get into the holiday spirit, Andy Hart. It is you on Friday in for Foyer, correct? Indeed, ten to two live. Let's have some fun and drink yeah. some eggnog. Uh, I, I got some eggnog I, the other I, day too. I, by the yeah, way, right. I can't find the caramel whiskey or the bourbon. I can't. That's no. the one thing I couldn't find. Isn't that what you said to get? That the set the salted caramel is the second best. The best is the bird dog maple whiskey. Sometimes you got to order okay, it. Bird order dog it maple. A case. Okay. Yes, bird dog maple. I'm I actually down. brought some in last night. We sampled it in studio. Stiz Keith and I had a nice uh, festive Wednesday oh. night. Oh, night look at you day. guys! Oh, was it from the Greg Hill barrel? Mm. 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 Personal mm. cast mm. only for Greg. Mm. Heart, we'll see you, buddy. <laughs> Thank you. Later. There Merry you. Christmas to all and to yeah. all a good night. That's right. We'll see you Friday. Andy Hart will be in for foyer on Friday as we uh, head towards uh, the holiday. Good stuff there from our uh, friend. Excellent. Andy Hart. Yeah, I love Hart. He's fantastic.